Yeah. yeah. And um, so basically, I'm an ex-Muslim atheist and secular humanist. Um, and I'm a Hafiz of the Quran. And uh, some of the biggest reasons why I left Islam were uh, evolution and sex slavery. Um, so basically, I can talk a little bit about my background. Um, I was born and raised in the United States. Uh, my parents are from India and Pakistan. Um, my dad is from Hyderabad, India. And my mom is from Karachi, Pakistan. And um, I was uh, really religious growing up. I prayed five times a day and I fasted uh, uh, 30 days every Ramadan. And um, I attended um, Sunday school for eight years. And uh, I went to private Islamic school for uh, three years from sixth to eighth grade. And I did Hips of the Quran for two years full time. Um, and I took several courses at Al Maghrib Institute. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh, in the United States, but. Um, I took courses under a lot of different shuyukh, uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi, Balid Basuni, uh, Muhammad Al-Sharif, Abdul Bari Yahya, Muhammad Faqi, Yasser Bijas. And I took a lot of different courses in Aqidah, which is Islamic theology, uh, fiqh, usul al-fiqh, hadith, akhlaq, etc. And I started doubting Islam when, when I was in university. Um, and I took a course called History 101. And um, I was expect, you know, we learn about like all the prophets, Adam, Noah, Noah and, you know, Musa, Isa, Muhammad, etc. And I used to believe that was literally true. And um, I used to think that, you know, since every human has a father and their father has a father and their father has a father and, and mother, etc. It would all go back to a single human being uh, named Adam. But in my um, uh, in the history course, the professor was talking about evolution and he was talking about like how the fact that humans and chimpanzees, you know, have a common ancestor that goes back six to seven million years ago. And that really confused me because I thought we were in history class and I used to believe that evolution was just fiction. Um, but then I decided to study evolution and then I realized that it's a very strongly supported theory. Um, if we look at the fossil record, then the um, fossils diverge over time and um, DNA, get, you know, as you get closer to other li living beings in terms of ancestry, your DNA starts matching more and more. Like humans and chimpanzees match by 98% DNA and humans and um, bananas, for example, match by 50% DNA. So all living, be it seems like all living beings are, um, you know, share a common ancestor. Um, and then once I learned about evolution, then that's when I started having uh, doubts about Islam. And then what happened was um, in August of 2014, on August 3rd, um, ISIS um, took over um, and they invaded the Sinjar mountain in Iraq and they took um, Yazidi women and girls as sex slaves. And growing up, I never ever heard about sex slavery. Like, no one taught it to me in any course. And I wasn't, I didn't learn it from Islamic school or anything like that. And I thought it had nothing to do with Islam. But uh, what happened was when I studied uh, Islamic history, when I read the Quran and the Hadith, then I realized that uh, what Prophet Muhammad did to Banu Qurayda uh, 1400 years ago is exactly the same as what ISIS did to Yazidi women and girls. Um, you know, he massacred all the, the men of the tribe and um, took the women and girls and distributed them to his male soldiers to rape. Um, and uh, what happened was uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, they signed a letter, an open letter to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and it was signed by 200 plus Islamic apologists. And they told him that you're spreading lewdness and corruption in on the earth, and that by the ijma of the Islamic scholars, sex slavery is no longer allowed in Islam. But um, so there was a response that was given in, in Dabiq magazine by ISIS, and they said that the rights that Allah gave us, no human beings can take away from us. Um, so I researched about this in the, in the Quran and the Hadith, and I, I realized that um, sex slavery is indeed allowed in Islam, and there's no prohibition for it, like unlike... Um, you know, like Hummer, wine, um, slowly it, it was eradicated. But the truth about sex slavery is Prophet Muhammad and his companions would go and invade villages and they would make, they would take women and girls and make them into sex slaves and distribute them to their, uh, to, to his soldiers. Um, there's a verse in the Quran, Surah Nisa, verse 24, which says that, uh, which means that all married women are forbidden for you except those whom your right hands possess. And there's hadith in uh, Sahih Muslim one four five six D, which says that. Um, uh, wait, I, I want to pause for a second, I, um, and I want to think about this verse because it says al muhsanati min al illa ma malakat aymanukum. So, like you said, those who are married are off limits for you. 
except those who your uh, right hands possess. So does that mean that if you have a slave who is married, she's not off limits for you? Exactly. I mean, you just have to wait. Kind of what yeah, the verse implies, right? Exactly. It's it's very explicit, and it's just um, you just have to wait for one menstrual cycle before you can rape her. Um, and um, there's a hadith uh, that explains this further. Uh, Sahih Muslim one four five six D, which says that during the battle uh, battle of Hunain, uh, the Prophet and his companions went to Altas, and they captured a group of women, and they didn't want to have sexual intercourse with them. They were afraid because the women had husbands, and their husbands were alive. So they asked Prophet Muhammad, and then he got revelation, Surah Nisa, verse 24, which said that it's okay to rape them uh, even if they're married uh, because they're your slave girls. So after I find out, found out about that, I, I realized that yeah, it's an extremely immoral religion, and it's not something that I could ever uh, support. And then um, there are other moral issues that I had with Islam, like um, polygyny, which is like the fact that men can marry um, up to four wives, but women have to be you know, loyal to their husbands. I just see it as like legalized adultery um, because um, if I just imagine myself and the roles are reversed and if my wife could take four husbands, then that's not something I would ever be able to bear. So I think women deserve the same kind of loyalty that, that men do. Um, and then also the, the hand chopping for theft. Uh, there's a hadith in uh, Al-Bukhari by Prophet Muhammad that said that Allah curses the one who steals an egg or a rope and his hand is cut off. Um, and there's a verse in the Quran that says um, in Surah Ma'idah, um, إِنَّ مَا جَزَاءُ الَّذِينَ يُحَارِبُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادًا أَنْ يُقَتَّلُوا أَوْ يُصَلَّبُوا أَوْ تُقَطَعْ عَيْدِهِمْ وَأَجُلُهُمْ مِنْ خِلَافٍ أَوْ يُنْفَوْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ uh, It means that uh, indeed the reward for those who uh, wage war against Allah and His Messenger and spread corruption on the land is to uh, crucify them, uh, kill them, cut off opposite hands or feet and feet, or exile them from the land. And I used to think that Prophet Muhammad was the kindest and most merciful person in the world, but after reading his biography, um, Ibn Ishaq, I realized that he's one of the cruelest people that I've ever re read about. There was this incident when um, there was a group of people who came to Medina and they got sick. So Prophet Mama told them to um, drink camel urine and milk. And what they did was they, they did drink that and they recovered. And then what they did was they killed the, the, the shepherd and they, um, they took the camels for themselves. So what Prophet Mama and his companions did was they, they found these people. And then what they did was they cut off their, all of their limbs and then he let he left them to die, and they were thirsty, and they were asking for water, but he didn't even give them water. Like that's the kind of moral level that he was at. And then um, some of the logical issues. Um, well, firstly, the fact that when I do dua, like I, I never get a response back. So that's something that I I thought about is the, the fact that you know what's the actual difference between some something that's imaginary and something that has like a basis in reality um harry potter and you know dumbledore lord voldemort santa claus these are all things that are written about in books and so is allah allah is written about in the quran but has no physical manifestation you know so that just led me to believe that um allah is just in, like a made-up character and then if you look at all the uh, religions of the world uh all, all in all the different regions for example in india you have the, uh, hinduism they, they each have their own religion and um, they have their own religious gods, they have their own origin stories, um, and they have their own, you know, teachings, and, and the teachings of each religion are uh, incompatible with the teachings of other religions. For example, in Hinduism, you have reincarnation, and in Islam, you have a heaven and hell. Um, and I, I was just thinking about the fact that um, nobody, like Prophet Muhammad knew just about, uh, as much about afterlife as you and I do. We're just humans like him, and I can just make up my own version of hereafter and I can say that anyone who doesn't follow me will be burned eternally in hellfire but if you just say that it doesn't mean that someone has to believe it because there's no evidence for it.